Coming up on this episode of Fuzz TV, lambing you hogs, the art of selecting stock for sale, and one farm's approach to watercourse management. In Ayrshire, a number of sheep farmers are looking for ways to improve efficiency and profitability. Lambing ewe hogs has the benefit of increasing output and profitability whilst reducing carbon emissions per kilogram of meat produced. Previously, we visited King's Arms where Robert and Caroline Dalrymple and their farm managers Andrew McLean and Andrew Nutt are keeping hogs with lambs at foot. You saw the hogs in the shade. Um, we started lambing them the end of March. So this is the, the single hogs here in this field. Um, Lamb down fairly easily. Um, we did feed them quite a lot as they we were tight for grass. But as you see by looking at the lambs, I think they speak for themselves really. There's not a lot more you can say. The hogs have grown out well and they've a, a nice lamb running beside them. The Texel Cross ewe lambs are tucked with the Beltex, wintered outdoors and are lambed in March. The hogs all run in a group. Um, we run them singles and twins. We just split them singles and twins, but they're all in two groups. Um, and we just try and keep them a wee, in a wee bit better grass than what they use it on. But this year it's been quite hard, so we ended up feeding them just for longer. They were fed into the middle of May. Not getting a lot, just kind of a quarter of a pound, but it was enough just to to keep them ticking over and growing and working milk into the lambs as well. So what age does Andrew start drawing fat lambs from the hogs? By the look of them today, I'm needing to maybe go through them. There's two or three big lambs in them, so I don't think we'll be that long to we're, we're getting an odd lamb out of them. Um, and then when Bell takes these, they kill out fairly well. So I would think even though they're grass-fed, I'll probably start drawing them about 39 and a half kilos and they should be killing out uh, the week later, about 20 kilos, I would think. Do you find that they get back in lamb OK, the same? Yep. Aye. Yeah, aye. Yeah, as, as long as we don't get into a lot of mastitis and things like that with them, but since we started using the bell takes on them, we find the bell takes lambs don't demand as much milk as a bigger lamb, so they're not quite as sore in the hogs. We do have, a, I think there's three maybe that's got mastitis, but aye. That happens. It's gave them something to pay their way. They're here anyway, so they're, they're just getting a bit better grass, a wee bit of cake, but you've a lamb to sell off them. And they've still grown out fairly well. They're going to, they're going to lamb down probably more lambs in them as well. For more information, visit faz.scot. Being open to change and adapting your business to meet the ever-changing market demands is key to building resilience in your business. The Mather family at Shandford Farm near Brecon have made significant changes to their beef enterprise over the last decade to meet market demands and improve the efficiency of their business. I'm Graham Mather. We're a family farming business here at Shandford Farm with my father, his two brothers, and then there's two cousins and my brother involved in the business. With uh, 325 suckler cows, started off, we were mostly limousine cross cows. We've now changed that over to more Aberdeen Angus cemental cross cows. And it was Charlie Bull used before, it's now all Angus Bull's been used on the farm. There's about 1,500 sheep lambed here, uh, mostly Texel cross yows, all homebred on the farm again, and uh, the lambs are all destined for sale through for for market. Good chunk of arable ground as well, producing spring barley and winter wheat. Historically, the business produced Charley cross store cattle, then moved on to finishing those cattle as bull beef. However, a change to the breed of bull used for heifers sparked a number of changes to the beef enterprise. Part of the reason for making the change was it was getting harder and harder to find heifer suitable for keeping for suckler cows. Also, with the health in mind, we've started doing yonis testing, so it makes sense to be 
breeding it ourselves as we've got control over it ourselves. We started off using an Aberdeen Angus bull and some heifers for easy calving. And we've seen how the Anguses were performing with the heifers and how the progeny were finishing and there was a bit of a demand there for them. So we decided to close the herd down and start breeding our own females. Calving everything at two year old now, rather than being 30 months to three year old. So they're, they're calving younger, I think they're maybe milking better and they seem to be quieter because they seem to know the farm better as well. Finishing enterprise has changed quite considerably. We used to be all Charlie bulls going on the cows and uh, a lot of bull beef was being done at the time and it was working really well for us. However, weight limits come in, age, age limits for when the bulls could be slaughtered came in and it made it difficult for us. So we've now moved on to Aberdeen Angus's Targeting to be finishing the Angus is about 600 to 620 maximum live weight, uh, and that's going away to be about 360 carcass weight. The finished cattle at Shandford are sold through the live ring at the local market, with cattle being purchased by local butchers. To keep on top of what the market wants, you've got to keep in contact with the market you're supplying. Speak to them, work with them, know what you're supplying, and be regularly weighing for selecting stock for slaughter, we run them over the weigh crate, ideally looking to have them at 600 to 620 kilos, about a 4 r 4 l is the kind of ideal grade we're looking for. Uh, they're handled in the crate when they're in the crate to see how much flesh is on their back as well and uh, we've been using the Ritchie Beef Monitor which is monitoring the cattle getting weighed as they're uh, weighed drinking water every day. A couple of benefits I've seen with the beef monitor when we've had it working in the shed. You would notice if an animal is maybe unwell sooner because it's not going into drink, so you've not got a weight, a weight recorded. Um, you see how your animal's performing on a daily basis. Um, I maybe wouldn't focus too much on the daily basis, maybe on a weekly basis. Um, and it gives you, a, gives, you, gives you the weights without having to go and weigh the cattle as well. The cows are calved in uh, the two, two blocks of calving, with a spring calving and a summer calving. We couldn't calve everything in the spring here just because the grass, grass growth higher up is slower. So there's about 120 cows calved in the spring. So at calving the cows are inside. They're on grass silage, some straw and turnips as they calve. Once they're calved, if the weather's ideal, they lay suited the head out to grass with their calves where they're out there for the for the summer until October, November time when they're coming in to be housed. Towards the end of that period the cows will receive uh, some silage or straw as necessary depending on conditions. When they come in to be weaned they'll be scanned, in-calf cows will be put out, back out to fodder beet it's been the last couple of years and strip grazed on the fodder beet up until depending on weather. Some years it's been February time until they come back inside, sometimes December. The summer calvers are calved outside on higher ground and they go into grass as they're calved as well. The calves are introduced to a creep feeder about three months old and uh, they're on that creep feeder getting fed the, the feed that, that we intend to bring them inside and wean them off their mothers and they go on a silage and cereal based diet and uh, that's them until finishing, hopefully finishing out of the house on the spring calvers. The summer calvers work a very similar routine, although the calves will go out to grass to be finished rather than being finished inside. It's all uh, homegrown cereal that's going into the mix. Grassland management, I suppose the, the spring calf and suckler cows, just because of the area they're grazing, it's kind of set up to be a paddock grazing. It's kind of like a weekly shift they're getting. Young cattle that are out of grass for finishing are tend to be they're going out on arable fields so it's not so easy to do the paddock grazing we'd have to have a lot of internal little fences and stuff set up so they're kind of set stocked but maybe shut up a bit tighter at the start of the summer and then an electric wire will be taken down to give them a fresh bite afterwards after silage has been taken. A bit of work we've done with soil uh, involved doing a bit of aeration with a all strong aerator uh, with a couple of grass fields that were struggling we had soil, some soil samples done on it and we realised we were very high in mag and low in calcium. So we applied calcium 
and with the aerator and we've seen the worms coming back into the soil and the grass has improved, the growth of the grass has improved and any time we get a good lot of rain, the rain tends to soak into the soil rather than just run off the surface. I hope there's a good future for beef farming in Scotland and I hope we can continue to sell our meat locally and I think the future maybe relies on making sure people, people realise they're getting a local produce that's produced on the doorstep rather than being flown in from around the world. My advice is if you're looking to change, look at what you can change to do. Look at what opportunities you have, see what's available to you locally and don't be scared to go ahead and do it. Ensuring grazing livestock have access to clean drinking water is a long-standing challenge to farmers. And it's no surprise that farmland field boundaries were set out in a way that maximised the access to open water from springs, streams and ditches. It can be a real animal welfare issue when those springs dry up and allowing livestock to access open water to drink can also bring problems of environmental damage through diffuse pollution causing water quality issues. At Harden's farm in the Scottish borders, John Anderson had many fields that he relied on such open water sources. He could see the damage his stock were doing and with the aid of funding through the Scottish Rural Development Programme, he set about trying to find a solution. The farmland rises from 130 to 340 metres above sea level. The mains pressure is poor and he already uses electric pumps to bring mains water from the bottom of the farm to the farmhouse and cottages. Upgrading this system was an option, but he was put off by the annual cost for water and pump maintenance. So he looked at alternatives and was keen to utilise a redundant reservoir on the farm that previously supplied water to the town of Duns. And after considering the options, he opted to install a ram pump system. Ram pumps are not new and have operated uh, on the principle that energy from the flow of water through the pump pressurises a percentage of that water which flows into the supply side. The ram, si the ram pump size is dependent on the requirements of the location. At Hardens, the water is being lifted over 100 metres in height to a storage tank more than a kilometre away. From that pump storage, the, ta uh, the water then feeds the entire farm with a gravity return pipe over two kilometres long. At the reservoir, a level twin wall six inch pipe feeds a constant level of water to the delivery tank, which is located above the ram pump chamber. To provide the necessary pressure to lift to the storage tank, a 10 meter head is required. To ensure that none of the energy is lost with the delivery pipe flexing, a 50 millimeter stainless steel pipe is used. The delivery tank acts also as a brake chamber, allowing air bubbles to escape from the system and avoids air locks. John chose to build a small shed to protect the pump from livestock and also the elements. 70% of the water that flows through the pump returns to the burn, with six and a half litres a minute being delivered at the top of the hill to the storage tank. The system has been working constantly day and night all year round for four years without a problem. Supplying water to all fields as well as the livestock sheds in the steading. Due to the funding support from the Scottish Rural Development Programme, the installation of the system has also allowed streams, springs and ditches to be fenced to protect the bank sides and exclude livestock. 
And this has had the added benefit of creating an enhanced network of wildlife corridors across the farm, benefiting wildlife and protecting water quality from diffuse pollution. Okay, we're in late August and the, the weather has been the, the typical pattern of, of sunshine and showers that we get at this time of year. As predicted, we've seen outbreaks of disease associated with lungworm in cattle. So as is typical, we've seen this in, in young, first grazing, dairy cross calves out to grass the, the, the first time. That's a typical presentation because these young calves have never seen lungworm before and therefore they, they get outbreaks of disease, coughing when, you know, when, they, when they get that for the first time. We have, however, also seen this in older cattle, in imported cattle and in, in adult cattle as well. So, so suckler cows with calves at foot where both the cows and the calves have been affected. And we have to presume that that means that the adult cattle being affected have not had the, the chance to build up exposure in previous grazing seasons. And that's why we've seen disease. So don't rule out lungworm as being a cause of coughing just because cattle are, are adults. Speak to your vet if you've got any doubts. Other parasitic diseases that we've seen in, in recent weeks are those associated with ticks. So when ticks bite, they'll transmit blood from one animal to another and they can transmit diseases along with it. So we've seen cases of babesiosis in adult cattle. This is quite a, a rare disease. It doesn't affect sheep, doesn't tend to affect calves, but it can affect adult cattle. So they may be seen dull, depressed, anorexic. And if, if their mucous membranes are looked at at the pink of the eye, often that's very pale. These animals can present as, as sudden deaths as well, so it's a whole spectrum of clinical signs that we, we see. We can diagnose the condition on a blood sample. So on a blood sample, they'll often have a low red blood cell count because they're anemic. And we can actually see the parasite, the bloodborne parasite, on a smear and there's a PCR available as well. So if you're seeing unexplained illness or deaths in adult cattle and you know you've got ticks on the farm, then do speak to your vet about, about try, trying to achieve a diagnosis. Another tick-borne disease that we see a lot of, and, and we get peaks of cases in September, so we'll expect to see more in the, in the coming weeks, are cases of louping ill, particularly in sheep, although we occasionally get them in, in cattle as well. So this is a, a virus that's transmitted by ticks and it causes disease in the brain. So it can present as maybe sheep being off their legs, perhaps paddling, perhaps trembling, or perhaps as, as sudden deaths. Blood samples can be taken to diagnose this condition and the blood samples can demonstrate that there are antibodies to the virus and the level of the antibodies that are there can let us know whether that exposure has likely been recent or not. So again, another one to, to, to think of, particularly when, when ticks are active as they are at, at this time of year. So in recent weeks and in weeks to come, up and down the country lambs are being weaned and this is a perfect time to check the condition of ewes as well. Ill thrift and ewes can be for a number of reasons and it can be investigating ill thrift can be a good way to check if there are iceberg diseases in your flock. So these are conditions that are maybe only apparent in, in a few animals, but if they're there, chances are there are lots more in the flock that are affected. We'll sometimes get ewes submitted to us as, as sacrifice ewes, cull ewes, so that we can look for evidence of iceberg diseases. So that's diseases such as Yone's disease, OPA, my Divisna and, and CLA. These iceberg diseases are ones that perhaps there are one or two animals in the flock that show really serious signs of the disease. But if they're there, then chances are there are a lot more animals that are subclinically affected in the flock. And so really that's causing more damage to, to, to the flock. So if you're going to investigate this condition, it's best to make sure that there are no other obvious reasons for these used to be ill thriven. So use with broken mouth, missing teeth, or use that are chronically lame, that's probably re the reason that they're thin. If you don't select them, choose ones where there's no obvious reason at all, then a post-mortem examination is a really good way to identify these other iceberg diseases. Weaning time can be a stressful time for, for lambs. And so at weaning time, we often see outbreaks of systemic pastoralosis. Obviously weaning is a stress. As well as that, we've usually got movements, we've got groups mixing together. And so all of these stresses together can predispose to systemic pastoralosis. So that's a septicemia caused by a bacteria called Bibersinia trehalosi. If there are other diseases ongoing as well, if there is um, high worm burdens, perhaps trace element deficiencies, then all of these together can predispose to this condition. There's a really good vaccine effective against systemic pastoralosis and so definitely make sure that the, the, the lambs have been covered against this. The vaccine also contains clostridial components, another really common cause of, of sudden death. So if the lambs aren't vaccinated, again, speak to your vet to, to make sure that they're, they're adequately covered.
So I hope that gives you a flavour of what we've been investigating this month and we'll see you next month and, and see what we've got to offer then. Next time on Faz TV, we focus on conservation with corncrake friendly farming, a unique use for wool in environmental management and peatland restoration. Mm -hmm.